Hi guys, my name is Jack Feely and I'm a multimedia sports journalism student and welcome to UCFB Wembley. Today I had the privilege of sitting down and having a chat with Seb from Hashtag United. We discussed the origins of the club as well as our brand new esports course that is coming to UCFB in September. Seb, great to see you again back at Wembley. Yeah, um, love it here, mate. A stadium that you've actually scored at before. Oh, I'm many, glad you mentioned yeah, it. Not many people can say that. Um, no. How does it feel to be back? I love coming back here. Absolutely love coming back here. I think it was actually in the goal. Uh, oh, no. Where's the tunnel? The tunnel's there. So it was in this goal, this end, actually. And then celebrated in that, in that corner flag with Spencer. It was pretty special. Um, and then, but not just that. I mean, we played it quite a few times as hashtag. And I think we played it four times. But just coming here as a kid, you know, watching some iconic games... The last time I was here was that fateful final in the Euro, sadly. Um, so mixed emotions, but, but coming back here, but always, always uh, a very special treat. Mainly good, mainly good memories. Mainly, mainly good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're going to go right back yeah, to the it. beginning of it all. Okay. Of it all. Um, now, we're going back to when it wasn't Hashtag United, and it was Spencer FC to begin with. Yeah. How did this, how did that idea all come about? Yeah, so um, effectively, there's... A number of origin origins to Hashtag United itself. And the very beginning of it, or was originally Hashtag FC, even before it was Spencer FC. Weird. So Spencer worked in a company called Copper 90. I'm sure you've heard of it. And there was a few other people within the football media space that all worked in similar companies. And they all lived in similar areas in London. And they made a seven-a-side team. And it was actually called Hashtag FC. Right. And there was a few Hashtag originals in that team, as well as Spencer. There was Faisal Majid or Manji. Mm -hmm. Legend. There was Wes yeah. Tansa. And there may have been a few others that I apologise for not remember. I think it was mainly those three. Mm. Um, but there was obviously no content. It was just, they called it that because they all worked in internet jobs. Yeah. Football jobs. So, fast forward, Spencer... Uh, has his own YouTube channel and um, Spencer has the idea to get together a group of YouTubers, football and gaming content creators, yeah. and to put them all together for a real game of football. And he was looking to make that as big and as special as it can. And it was actually also around about the sort of time that I started um, coming on board and helping him with the oh, yeah. partnerships and sponsorships and those sort of things. And it was actually EE mm. who yeah. not only wanted to support the vision of his, but they just secured the rights that we see now all around this stadium, connected by EE, the naming rights to the stadium. So they were looking for ways to bring that partnership to life for them. So not only were they going to help fund this project of his, but they let us play the game right there at yeah. Wembley. So um, that was the first idea of getting YouTubers to make uh, football teams. And obviously now there's been lots of creator-led football matches ever since then. The Sidemen games, more recently things like Clash of Creators. Um, and, but Wembley Cup was sort of the first of, of, its, of its kind. Yeah. And it was a really, really big success. It turned out we started actually selling tickets to the game, got some really big footballers to come and play. I got to score a goal in front of 30,000 people in this stadium, which was amazing uh, as part of that. And through that whole process, we sort of had developed that there was really a massive appetite for people to see these content creators playing real football. Um, the problem was we couldn't get Wembley every week and we couldn't get um, sort of big brands to put up the sort of money needed to put on that big spectacle and get all the big YouTubers involved every week. So the idea was to draw that back and make it more about Spencer, myself as his brother, who had started to be in some of his content as well, mm -hmm. and our friends. So we actually were pitching it to a number of brands again to be the first sponsor. Right. And on the train up to Manchester, um, we had the idea of making like a divisional structure that replicated like FIFA seasons mode. So, for example, gamifying real-life football. Yeah. So, it made it legitimate. So, it was still 90-minute matches, still proper FA-accredited referees, but we were selecting our opponents. We were making our own made-up division. Mm -hmm. So, we basically did our own football pyramid that started at uh, Step 5, if you like, or Division 5, as we called it. And in Division 5, we'd play a batch of opponents of a similar type of ilk and similar theme of difficulty, but we'd play them when we wanted and where we wanted. So instead of being like, it's a Sunday league, you've got to play on this pitch at this time, are they going to let you film, is it going to get called off, all these things. We'd make it like a building a show to give us regularity, and that's one of the most important things in building anything online, is to have a plan and some consistency mm -hmm. and how you can shape it. So we did that, and in Division 5 we played like celebrity type teams, like Sky Sports News, Presenter 11, uh, the West Ham media team, these sort of things, Vauxhall, 
let us play here again. And our, one of our first ever games was at Wembley here in a game. And that really evolved and evolved. And that's what made the team popular is that we had this storyline where every game was crucially important. We we're playing for three points in Division 5 to get a total. So in Division 5, it was 12 points to get promoted to Division 4. And then we'd play a little bit harder teams and a little bit harder teams and they have to get more points. And that was the structure we used all the way through to the Division 1, yeah. which was basically the Wembley Cup year three, I think it was, where we had 34,000 people here for Hashtag United against the F2. And that was like to basically finish off Division 1. And then that's when we spoke to the FA about um, becoming a real football team, our yeah. Pinocchio moment, <laughs> where we actually entered the real world of football and we started playing a lot more regularly and everything expanded from there, really. But that is sort of where it all came from, was the... the, the, the um, doing something we wanted to do, which was play football with our mates, but do that in a way that um, allowed for success on YouTube, that gave us all those opportunities and made a narrative that people could attach to that was, that was fun, I guess, and yeah, here we are. Yeah, and as you mentioned there, it's, it's, a, it's a unique football club. Mm. And for a lot of fans, actually, and you mentioned they're the Wembley Cup and you, know, you have fans in the stadium. For a, lot of, um, for a lot of fans of football, that was their first game at Wembley mm. for a lot of those fans um, and it obviously it's the un un uniqueness of the club how does it feel to I don't know how does it feel to um, branch out to this new audience and give them those experiences yeah I mean it's just incredible like we constantly have we're, it's we're a very small team um, whether you look at it on the, the the football side of it you know it started off just me Spencer and Alex in hashtag and Alex Spencer's fiance and it would be you know, and then it'd be my younger brother Saunders would be editing the videos. It's a very, very small team, and that's grown a long way since then. But the point I make is that there's always so much going on, constantly moving from one project to the next project to the next project. There's been very few moments where I've really sat back and thought, "Bloody hell, did that actually just happen? Like it's crazy." And uh, some of those were that night, you know, in the Wembley, Wembley Cup where we were celebrating in the Three Lions Bar, and you know, I'm just like, "Oh my God!" Like I've just scored a goal at Wembley and I'm in the corner flag with thousands of people screaming and I'm with my brother and we're like high-fiving in the corner, me doing my little golf celebration yeah. and uh, our family are here, all my friends that I've not spoke to in years are like seeing it streamed online, it's like 300,000 peak concurrent viewership watching online and like millions watched it on demand and um, just you think what on earth is going on? I actually remember for the following year's Wembley Cup we sat in Spencer's dining room and we had Rhea Ferdinand, we did, the, the, the last year we did it, we had loads of different YouTube teams. It wasn't just one game, it was a, a tournament and then there was the final here. Uh, and the semis and the final were here and we made some different rules and we made some really fun stuff actually. That's the beauty of when you're doing it in your own world, you can make up things that can be entertaining. And we actually, hashtag used, uh, tested some technology for the, for the first time ever. So um, uh, the, I believe the goal line technology, first time it was ever used in a live stadium game was Hashtag United Wembley Cup Final. Um, and um, that was the beauty of it, is that the game was big enough that it mattered. There's a lot of people watching, there was a live production going on, so it had to work well, but it wasn't an FA Cup Final or a World Cup. So the technology got a bit of a stress test. Um, but yeah, to do that, so that, that next year, Rio Ferdinand was, we, so we did these teams and we did a draft, an NFL draft style thing where um, the t teams involved, if they had, based on how they did in the, in the uh, group stages, they would get to draft some players. They'd draft some extra YouTubers to join their teams and they get to draft a, like a, an ex-legend. And we had Rio in for one of the teams. But also, as well as being in Hashtag, you know, me and Spencer sort of produced that show as well with the agencies and with EE who, who are behind it all. And we had to find a replacement for Hashtag for Rio. And we sat in his living room, in his dining room, and we're talking to the agents of the teams. It's like two days to the, to the game here. And we're like, right, we had some options. And our options were uh, William Gallas, uh, came down to Gallas and Mendieta. So there's me and Spencer sitting in his living room. Who should we sign for hashtag Mendieta or Gallas? We're literally online going through highlights, looking at how they're getting on right now. Um, it was just absolutely bizarre. We ended up with Gallas yeah. and he was unbelievable. He was unbelievable. Just how he conducted himself, how he got involved. Because the thing is, for us, it's like the biggest day of our lives. But for them, you know, it's like some charity game. They've played in front of thousands of people hundreds of times. So they come in and they, they really made it feel special for us. And 
pretended like they cared a lot or not. And Gallas was, was amazing. So yeah, moments like that when you think like how have we come this far or where you've got, you know, when you're uh, so many experiences like that, you, you don't really reflect on when you're in them until you sit back and, and really think about it. That's been unbelievable. You, <laughs> you're scouting former I know, it's crazy. professional. It's, I know. It's, it's, there's, there's some things like uh, Robbie Savage played for us that day. So like hashtag X players, it lists like Gallas, Robbie yeah. Savage is hilarious. <laughs> it's great. So would you see, it's obviously playing with ex-professionals mm. in, at Wembley yeah. in front of fans. Was that the next step up? Was that the, the push that the club needed to become the hashtag th- that we know today? I think that was like the celebration of the end of the first chapter where we'd sort of made this media team that was all about, you know, we were always very much trying to win every game, but it was more about entertainment and it was about going on these international tours and doing these things and the academy series that we worked with, with UCFB on as well in more recent times. And it was about doing these amazing projects that could bring people into football in a different way, let them interact with the game, let them interact with people in a different way. Um, and I think Wembley Cup was like a crescendo of that. And that sort of made us a big enough thing to then say, right, what's the evolution now? And the evolution then was very much to become a real team, join a real league where we're not picking the opponents, where we're not picking the venues, where it's, right, this is real football now, semi-pro or grassroots, non-league football, whatever you want to call it. Um, and see if this team could survive um, and go on that journey, really. And that's what we've been on ever since. So how did that process come about? How did, how did so we basically wrote to the FA and we said, right, where could we join? What level could we join at? Because it goes all the way down to like step 10. And there was a space due to a um, restructuring of the league system that meant there was a gap at step six. And we had a good enough case based on our background and our sort of resources that we could become a step six team, very thankfully. Otherwise, we have to start even lower. Um, so step six, which is the 10th tier, is the same level at which AFC Wimbledon started at when they split from MK Don, the same level with the Salford City were at when they were um, when they partnered with the class of 92. So it's a reasonable level, but still, you know, long way down, down the pyramid. So we got in there, we had to go and get ourselves a ground share because you didn't have to have a very particular stadium you have to use. We had to go and we went from playing two games a month to playing sometimes two or three times a week, which meant a lot more content, which was a lot more staff, a lot more um, money needed to be spent to make the team happen. Um, so we had to go and sign some big partnerships, which is sort of my main role at the club is to secure sort of the, the commercial partnerships. And it was a massive undertaking, really. And, um, and yeah, thankfully, we've been able to get on a couple of back to back promotions. And now we've got the women's team and we've got youth teams and um, and obviously, of course, Amongst on top of all of those things, we've got the esports team, which has been um, a very different world in that not only do a lot of people watch it, but these guys who are representing our club are playing at the absolute world class level. So you know, we're playing against the big traditional esports organisations across the world, and some of the big sporting organisations like West Ham, Man City, PSG all have their own esports teams and much bigger budgets than us. So our esports guys have been flown all around in normal times, flown all around the world, competing for big, big money against the very, very best in the world. Was that a new challenge then? That did you did you expect to when you started obviously hashtag United, did you expect to go into the esports side of things and how was that so a challenge enough, for you guys? The, the esports team technically came first. So the Academy series that we're best known for is the football one, but we actually did something called the Spencer FC Game Academy before Hashtag United exist, existed, which was a competition to win an esports contract for a team that didn't exist. Because there were no esports teams. There were no um, E Premier League. There was no FIFA E World Cup. There was a thing called the FIFA, uh, the FIFA Interactive World Cup. Um, and that was a one-off tournament, very dim game, and near the same coverage as, it, as they get now, much smaller prize. I think it was maybe 10, 20 grand for the winner. Now it's like quarter of a million. And we did like an eight episode theme at Gfinity Arena in London where People were, I think 20,000 people registered to take part in the competition. There was an online qualifier. Then the finalists all came down. We did like an apprentice style show where there's challenges and people are voted off and blah, blah, blah. And then there's a contract at the end and Harry Hesketh, hashtag Harry as he became to be known, uh, won that contract to play for Spencer FC, but then immediately transitioned into us also having an esports team. And then we did a few tournaments ourselves that we set up. We started lobbying a lot of the Premier League team. So I went and saw most of the Premier League clubs trying to incentivise them or trying to encourage them, is a better word, to start esports teams because none of them had it. So all being West Ham fans, we were saying, guys at West Ham, because we'd know them quite well, you need to start an esports team. And they're like, oh, okay, well, we're not really sure. Should we go? And they did. 
and we knew the guys at Man City well. We collaborated well with them because they're one of the big Premier League teams that really got YouTube from an early stage and they've gone on to probably be the most successful football team on YouTube. Um, and we gave them the runner-up, for example. So the runner-up in our eSports Academy was became the Man City Pro. So we then we remember seeing all the other Premier League clubs telling them you need to get into esports. Some of them did, some of them didn't. Now they're all into it, of course. Um, so that was right at the beginning. That was always Spencer's vision as a FIFA content creator. He very much saw the evolution of that space going into the competitive world, and which is what's happened. And now we've got things like the e Premier League. We've got things like the FIFA Global Series. All these different events now that are put on is a whole ecosystem. And there are dozens and dozens of people who are professional FIFA players. And we've seen esports grow enormously in the last decade across a number of different titles, especially internationally with games like League of Legends, for example. And FIFA has more recently come to that fray and is very much at sort of that crowning boom moment um, where that is growing out. I mean, we're now seeing players going for big money. We're, we're involved in one of the first big money transfers ever in the esports FIFA scene, where we sold one of our players, Tom Lease, hashtag Tom, to Excel. Um, and you're now seeing players earn lots of money and the brands are coming into esports and the partnerships are there, which means the content's got to be there. So there's player managers, there's player agents, there's um, commercial partners, there's business development, there's production. There's so many new jobs now in esports. Um, it's an it's a industry growing at an mm. alarming rate. I say alarming, at a great rate, a fantastic rate. And as you say, it's you know, growing massively. Do you think it could ever be as big as the mainstream? I've learned one thing in my in my time is you never say never to anything like the world is changing at such a rate and you know with things like the metaverse coming along and um, everything changes in my opinion everything evolves um, I mean we're seeing now things like the Fortnite World Cup the Fortnite World Cup um, a couple of years ago where that young I think he was 18 won it it's a lad actually from Essex and he won in prize money for winning the Fortnite World Cup more than Novak Djokovic won for winning Wimbledon, more than Tiger Woods won for winning the Masters in his comeback year, and more than a number of big mainstream elite world-class sports win for the pinnacle of their sport, the Fortnite World Cup winner won more. And that's purely because of the eyeballs and the attention on that event. Um, the demographic they reach and the brands that want to act, that's where the money comes from in esports. The money effectively is gonna come from advertisers. That's where the biggest revenue builder are prize money of course, TV deals, but prize money and TV deals are through event sponsorship and from um, rights deals to broadcast the events. Platforms like Twitch or television networks all around the world, um, as well as ticketing and revenue uh, for, for, for actual live stadiums. That's the thing that for FIFA to mature to is um, in some other European countries and certainly in uh, other continents, you are seeing stadiums being filled out with tens of thousands of people watching esports events happen live. Um, we haven't quite seen get to that scale in the UK, it's definitely growing, but the online viewership is getting bigger and bigger, so more and more brands are coming into FIFA. FIFA has a huge benefit in some ways in over other esports, in that there's very recognizable and celebratory IP in FIFA. So there's Ronaldo, there's Real Madrid, there's Wembley Stadium, for example. So there's existing IP that people can get excited about. You've got the fan culture of football that already exists and you've got millions of people that play the game that take an interest in that game. The downside to that is watching FIFA being played on a screen is never going to be, I don't think, as enjoyable as watching a live, real-life football match, right? So you've got an alternative that's there um, in that. Other esports don't have those recognisable IP that already have a ready-made audience to migrate to, but they have mythical, exciting worlds where you can run around and blow stuff up and do things you can't do in the real world. So Almost like an escape. Yeah, yeah. so like a, another dimension you can escape into and things you can see that otherwise you can't see in the real world. You can't see in a live stadium. So there's the advantage of that. But the big opportunity that FIFA has is that a lot of brands now that want to move into esports, FIFA is a very safe entry point for them in that it's, it's, it's actually an esport of a sport. So you know, esports will be m number of titles, we, you know, whatever it is you're doing, uh, whatever is the game or that particular title does, whereas the actual act of FIFA is actually football, right? So that's a very safe thing. They understand they're sponsoring teams, there's kits that look like football kits, there's always opportunities that make them feel very comfortable, and it's a family-friendly environment, whereas some of the other bigger, huger esports titles competitively 
they are maybe, um, you know, where you're running around killing things, that's not as family friendly, for example. So, and also some of the brand marketing teams and brand sponsorship teams maybe don't feel as comfortable sponsoring something that even though it's massive, they don't quite understand as much, they maybe feel a bit more comfortable with FIFA. So FIFA has a lot of advantages in that, but the downside to it is it hasn't quite yet got the scale where you can have, um, you can have uh, the millions and millions of pounds of prize money that you find in some of the other esports titles. But good, we'll get there soon. Yeah, um, and also in esports, mm. Um, there's been a few, you know, criticisms of this new, you know, developing part of, you know, of, of, of the online world. Um, how can we, or how can, you know, these esports companies and brands break down these barriers and actually show to the critics that this is an exciting opportunity for people to get involved in? So, my personal opinion on these things is it just takes generational time in that, when you have the key decision makers, whether that's in a brand and where they're going to spend their sponsorship money or in a TV company, what they're going to broadcast, people at the top tend to be the people that have been there the longest. So sometimes they're, old, they're the oldest. So they're of a generation where they didn't do that. And the reason they're in the senior positions is because they've been very successful. And they've done things the way they've been grown up doing them and they've become successful. So it's only a few of them that have the vision to go, right, to remain successful, I'm gonna now do something that I've never done before in a world that I don't understand and I'm gonna stake all of my reputation and my career's success and go in a different direction. Not many people are willing to do that. So traditionally what you'll find is people from the, in the more junior entry level positions will come in and be from that world, from that generation, digital, gaming, esports, they get it, we should be doing this, we should be doing this. And they might get to a middle management who says, yeah, that's a good idea, let's try and do that to the higher ups. And sometimes they'll get a few projects away, small, and they'll grow and they'll be successful and they'll do a bit more and it takes time. But the real wave of it is when those entry point people become middle management and they themselves who understand it fully can put the pressure on the higher ups or then they become the higher ups and then all of a sudden they become successful in their careers through doing what they understand and that's built them success and they then can go crazy and allocate all the resources of these big companies and industries into those sports. So I think things take time to change and often it's because there's not a large enough proportion of decision makers willing to do to go all in in a completely new world until they're forced to because at the same point what they might be doing is still effectively working so it's not like right nothing's working we've got through something new it's that they they in order to try new things they've got to a stop doing what they've already done I think hopefully this makes sense and they've got to then put resources into something new so it tends to be a little bit at a time so basically people have to retire or die. <laughs> That's what happens, right? It's the way of the world. And my opinion is that if you like to look at things at a very human, practical level, that's what has to happen, it has to be the passage of time because you're just not gonna get enough people go, right, we're now gonna do exactly what all these youngsters say straight away, whatever they say, we don't understand it, we're gonna put millions of money into that, thank you. Some do, and they get successful and they're the early movers and they're the ones that can get the biggest benefit. But it doesn't always work that way. So it will take time then. For it will take time. Those. But that's why people that are getting in there for the beginning are building experience, are building understanding, are building a network that we spoke about a bit off camera, incredibly important things to be doing and to be patient. They're creating that thing. pathway. Yeah, they're yeah. creating that pathway. It's, it's not, nothing, um, you know, I'm guilty of this as much as anyone. I want everything now. Uh, for one idea, I want that to be successful now. But it's not necessarily about that. It's that be involved in something that you're passionate about, that you see has, has, has huge potential. And being in early, when it's not already massive, should be a massive, exciting opportunity because you're gonna have a much greater chance to make a bigger difference at something when it's being built around you than going into, imagine if you're trying to become a football agent today, right? Great, phenomenal opportunity, and uh, I wouldn't discourage people from doing it, but you're going into a super competitive world. People that have been making huge amounts of money, already got all the contacts. To make a breakthrough into that world from nothing is incredibly hard. Whereas to get into a world like esports, for example, where it's already pretty big now, but could get even bigger, getting in now gives the opportunity to make a real name for yourself, to then be one of the top um, parts of that industry in the future. And do you think that's what Hashtag have done successfully? Oh gosh, um, I don't know. Um, I'd like to hope we've done what we, what we, what we, um, uh, let's think about this. So, have we, have we done that? I don't know, it's not made for me to say. What I would say is that we have, what we have done to a most extent is stayed in our lane a little bit is that we've had lots of opportunities to branch out into other esports. And we did that briefly with a thing called the Gfinity Elite Series, which was a league we were in where the 
uh, league was multi-roster. So it was FIFA, it was Rocket League, and it was Street Fighter. So we got Rocket League and Street Fighter rosters for that particular tournament. However, realistically, what we tried to do is be a football club for the modern day football fan. And we believe that just like maybe in my generation and the one before it, match of the day, going to the game on a Saturday in the stadium was the bulk of your football uh, ecosystem and a big part of your attachment to the game. Now I think games like FIFA are an enormous part of your experience of football. I think there's very few football fans that are coming through now, whether that's from 10, 12, 11 through to 20s, 30s, where FIFA or football computer games like Football Manager hasn't been an enormous part of their football experience. So therefore, I think um, we wanted to make sure that we are all things to that modern day football fan. So that's digital, social, content, but gaming. It's a huge part of that. Hashtags Very Origins were from gaming backgrounds that became into a gamified version of real football. So I think we've tried to have our own position in that. Um, we've cemented ourselves as one of the biggest names in the FIFA esports scene, for sure. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a huge long way to go, I think. How did you um, and your team embrace those new challenges, in, you know, managing those, you know, these new huge events like the Wembley Cup and all yeah. the esports competitions? So Wembley Cup is just an enormous endeavour. Like without the support of VE, you know, on some of the shoot days for Wembley Cup, we might have had 50, 60 people crew just on the production side, plus all the talent. Huge endeavours to do. Like just a massive team with a very well-resourced budget from the, the partner in EE uh, make those things possible. With regard to esports, because we started at the very, very beginning of FIFA esports I'm talking about. So for example, there have been loads of FIFA tournaments, but... Uh, as an actual of competitive event is very different to that, um, especially when prize money becomes involved. So it was actually us that hosted the first ever FIFA professional football team event. So there were no FIFA esports teams. There was Wolfsburg, there was Schalke, Sporting Lisbon, West Ham, Man City, hashtag United. And we were one of the first, if not the first of those, to have an actual team with a professional player playing for us. So when these other, we'd lobbied and these other guys had started doing it as well, we said, right, we'll host one. There's no event. We've all got FIFA Esports pros. What the hell are they playing in? There's the FIFA, FI, FIFA Interactive World Cup, one event a year. There's nothing else, right? There might be some people put on events for money. But there's no actual professional, you know, like tour or schedule of events or ecosystem of events. So we spoke to all the teams and said, right, we'll do one. So we put up the money. We put up the production money. West Ham put up the venue. So we did it at London Stadium. It was all the teams I just mentioned, taking each other on. And there was a prize money, which we, which we put up. And Harry won it, thankfully. So Hashtag United won the first ever um, professional FIFA team. It's a mouthful this, but yeah. Um, and that was the beginning, really. And EA were at that point, were building out their ecosystem, was gone on to become the FIFA Global Series. And then they've changed to the FEWC. And then you've got the FIFA E Club World Cup now. You've got E Nations. You've got all these different events now from FIFA themselves and from EA and from other licensed organisations like the Super League in Denmark or the EMLS, all these different, um, e Premier League, all these different ecosystems for pros to thrive in now. But that very first one was not too different a setup like we've got today. You know, being content creators, we knew, and being FIFA content creators as well, you're filming two people play FIFA. So you've got to have multiple cameras set up, you've got to have good audio, you've got to have the right console, you've got to have a game capture, and then ideally you've got a nice backdrop, which is what was provided by West Ham and the London Stadium. So very primitive, very much like a YouTube video shoot, but that then evolves into what you've got now, which are the huge venues, the LAN events, where you've got dozens of players playing at each time, you've then got the live stream of that going out, um, you've got the technological side of it uh, to make sure those games can all run concurrently. You've got referees on site. There's a huge amount that goes into it. And the guys from EA and their partnership agencies who put those events on, they plan for months and months and months. So you're talking about venue, location. You're not just thinking about what's a good location to, to let this take part in um, for uh, practical reasons and logistical reasons. But you've got to think about the players that are coming in from all over the world, from Brazil, from, J from Japan, from Europe, from everywhere. They've, they've got to fly in. It's got to be a good spot for that. Um, so many things to be thought and into, uh, thought about. Uh, so a lot, a lot goes into that, absolutely. Um, and uh, it's it's another area where is a big growth area yeah. for people in event management and esports for sure. You listed, you know, a number of things that a number of things that you have to think about before you know starting these events. Before you even, yeah, before you even actually yeah. running it on the day, yeah, the planning. Obviously yeah. the venue. The players, you know, all the technology that's needed to run. You've got to pay for all that as well. Yeah, so you've got to the find money brand side partners, of things, yeah. commercial partners. 
that believe in your vision. So you've got to be able to structure an event that you think is going to be appealing enough that you can then sell into partners to get money that you can put up for prize money that entice the players to take part, then allows you to go out and hire the production team, to hire the marketing team, to then deliver the event so that it is successful, so your partners get value, so you can then get them to re-sign or bring in new partners to grow the event for the next year. So there is, there is so many different facets to it. And there must be tough parts of the job, but for someone that is running or managing an event, what are the rewards that you can get out of? The, the rewards are probably on the day when you see live sport, including esports, have incredible moments. So when uh, something happens in a game that someone comes back to steal a victory and you see everyone's faces are like completely gripped on the screen in these one moments of wow and big celebrations and those clippable viral moments that go out, that you know is what I think every sports fan loves and enjoys. And esports is no different to that. Um, what I think most event managers would tell you is that an event just happens without any any huge problems, you know, because there are so many moving parts and everything we just said, um, so little has to go wrong for so many domino effects to happen. And before you know it, you've got a disaster on your hand. Uh, so trying to do all those things we just mentioned in a COVID world, uh, you know, very, very difficult for uh, events to happen right now, that's for sure. Um, so I think most of the time, most people involved on the planning of an event just want a stress-free, no disasters to happen and just the technology to work all the equipment to work, the broadcast to go out okay. And as long as the event is finished and you tick to those boxes, you're probably quite happy to be honest. Yeah. And for someone that is looking to go into managing an event, what would you say are the main things to take with you while you are you know, embarking on this new journey? I think um, the best thing to do would be to go and work at an event. Uh, work in the planning, in the production, in the event management, as part of a team in an event and just see all the different bits and find out what bits of those you like because I think it's very unlikely that um, and make a small event yourself whether it's you know it sounds crazy but make a small, a small event with your friends and film it and try and figure out what are the problems like if you've got to have 10 mates around to film FIFA like where are you going to do it can you do it in a living room is that big enough room uh, have you got the right light can you get the right game capture to work do you remember the spare batteries for the controller all these little things you've got to think about doing on a granular level between you and your mates to film it and produce and edit a video that maybe doesn't even go online just for you to enjoy would be phenomenal practice to do to learn all the different things you have to think about you know um, so then working at a larger event to gaining a bigger understanding of what can happen it would definitely be all about experience because it's um, uh, and learning and making as many mistakes as you can um, so that would be I would say anyone who wants to get into that would be yes to learn all the fundamentals but I would say the best thing would be to, to find a route to getting practical experience of being involved in a live event. So experience is, you know, obviously crucial, mm. but there's, although people know about, obviously, you know, it's grown massively esports and a lot of people know about it. And there's an increased, um, there's an increased um, attention on it now and people want to get into that area, mm. that sector. Do you think an increased academic knowledge of esports will be able to allow people to you know secure these jobs in esports and like like UCFB's you know new course esports course that will come out yes. starting September do you think those courses will you know create these individuals that can go on and succeed in those roles well, of course i think being able to get the key skills you'll need to be part of any event planning to get the experience you'll need is invaluable people have got to let you through the door if someone's managing a huge project and the last thing they want is a liability running around that doesn't know what they're doing. So you've got to have some way of adding value to that. So whether that's through planning and logistics, whether that's through production, can you shoot uh, and, or help with audio? So can you learn about the production things? Can you learn about uh, promotion of that event? Can you help with uh, lead generation for sponsors for the event? All those things you mentioned, there's every single one of those has got a number of roles within that one subsection. So can you shoot and edit? Can you help set up audio? Can you help source venues? What, what are the skills that you can learn that enable you to be valuable to someone to get the experience? Because unless you're very, very well connected, you're very fortunate, you're not gonna just get, oh yeah, come along to our uh, FIFA E World Cup and just hang about and learn if you want. You've gotta have a way of adding value to those organizations. So getting the skills and the knowledge that you're gonna to need to be able to add value, even if it's to some small part, of that endeavor is going to allow you to get the rest of it. And although it, and it may obviously it's exciting from the outside, but you need to know every single bit of it, and that's course that we're offering. I, I think that I think the best thing about the course is that it's going to have an opportunity to get knowledge or skills in lots of different areas. So that gives people the opportunity of dialing into an area, whether it's production, for example, or whether it is commercial 
whether it's development, business development, um, where, whatever that section you want to go into, it's going to probably give you a, a little bit of everything, a little bit of a taster, and that's what you need to do. Because to be successful at anything, you need to be able to enjoy that one area. So to get a grounding in all of them is going to be great, but then, then to get the exposure to the different parts of esports or event management to find out what you enjoy, because you're not going to be good at much that you don't enjoy, I don't think. So we'll go back to you know, the creation of Spencer C and Hashtag United. And when the Hashtag United YouTube channel started, or let's say when the Spencer C YouTube yeah. channel started and Spencer C began, did you ever see YouTube for Hashtag as a career pathway or as, as a business venture to begin with? The answer is no, really. I mean, Spencer was making YouTube videos before anyone was making a living on YouTube. There are some, I don't know if they're still out there, there are some videos that he would do as skits, some of them I was in as well, of us messing around in the garden, him singing Queen with his oh, shirt we've got off. To find them. We've There's got some to find gold them. out yeah. there somewhere. And um, he's always had a creative mind, definitely. And he enjoyed making those videos before anyone was really watching. And his in entry into YouTube was through stand up comedy. And he was on the sort of student stand up scene. I used to drive around to different gigs and watch him performing to literally five people and I was one of them, right? <laughs> and he learnt, uh, and I think is a bit of a metaphor for how the world is changing, that he could go to, say, Cambridge to perform at a Students' Union comedy night and he would have to drive an hour and a half to get there. He would have to pay the fuel to get there. He would have to turn up and perform to that room of 10 people and he has to come home and do all those things. And it's half a day or a full day and it's costing money to do that. Or he could film something at home and put it on the internet and it could reach 100 people. And it's like, oh, this is a bit more efficient way of doing it. And this is so crazy to think that way because of how YouTube has grown and blown up since then. But you're talking over 10 years ago. People weren't thinking in that way. So he then started putting some of his skits online and he was learning what people liked because the views go up. You know, he didn't have a big YouTube. He had maybe, I don't know, 100 subscribers or something. You know, it's the algorithm doing what it does, someone enjoys it, they watch a lot of it, it starts pushing it to a few more people, and you get to learn and look at comments, what people like, and you get to develop and learn in that way. He then went to work in TV, he worked at Channel 4, he worked at Copper 90, worked for Vincent Company, running all of his social media channels before there were social media, before I think Instagram existed, we're talking almost probably back then, or very early days of it, if, if not. And he wanted to, he made a, he made a, he was working with Copper 90 and he started making his own videos and then he, he left that job to focus full time on his own channel. Um, and at the very beginning, just starting to see a bit of the creator economy beginning, like a few of the YouTubers are getting 100,000 views and maybe getting a little bit of ad revenue and a few sponsorship deals and they can maybe supplement their job and they can maybe get some of their income from YouTube. And as that grew and grew, it became a thing. So Spencer genuinely is one of a, a, a generation that can actually say, they committed to YouTube before there was any promise of any, any return. And was it that commitment and that desire and the passion for it that you know, is now led to the creation of Hashtag? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, his, his ability, a lot of it's got to come down to timing. I'm sure he'd say the same thing as well. He was of an age and of an interest where the internet was on a, uh, the YouTube community was on a, an explosion point. But you've got to have the right content ideas. You've got to have the work ethic. YouTubers often get tarred with the same brush. There's a whole such a big different ecosystem of creators out there, but the ones that are very, very successful, it may look like they're just messing around having fun. There is a huge amount of work that goes into it. It's a huge amount of stress as well. Like, it's not maybe the most grafting job, as in, you know, your, your, your manual labor, but it can be very mentally challenging when you're coming up with ideas and editing, creation, and turning it around um, super, super quick. And I saw that firsthand in those early days, how hard him and Alex were working. They used to do a thing called Death Sember, which is uploaded every single day in December. Anyone that makes remotely regular content, like daily vlogs, anything like that, the work going on behind the scenes is, you wouldn't believe it, it's like way more than 10, 12 hour days you're talking. Incredible, complete overtaking of your mental capacity. Um, and because he was willing to do that and he enjoyed doing it and he's very, very good at it, that allowed him to, to, to break through and then to, for then, the next idea he had to be seen by a, more, a greater amount of people to then allow it to go bigger. And ultimately, it was his idea for the Wembley Cup was really the big boom moment for his channel where he had enough of an audience that he could convince EE with a really good idea, if we put it on this channel, it can be successful, can deliver value for you. The audience loved it. 
the rest of YouTube that didn't know about, about his channel and his content then found him th because they'd seen the Wembley Cup and they liked that as a concept. And that gave him a platform for his next idea and that gave a platform for Hashtag to go on. Because at one point, Hashtag was a series on Spencer's channel. We didn't know what it was going to be. It was an idea to make regular football content on his channel. And it just became of a size that it got its own channel and its own social media and then its own team and our offices and all the rest of it. Thank you, Seb. Hey, Appreciate you coming down to talk to me. Yeah, no, thank you. Absolutely.